your presence tonight with thanksgiving, Lord. We love you and we worship your name. God, I pray that you would come into this place tonight. God, renew each and every one of us, Lord. Make us new in you, Lord, that we may worship and that we may praise your name. God, we love you, Jesus. God, you are good, Jesus. We praise you. thankful for the way you've been moving this morning, God, and the way that we feel you here tonight. Lord, I pray that you come into this place, Lord, and that you renew us. God, flood this place with your presence, Lord. Let us feel you once again, God. Lord, we're so thankful for your mercy. We're so thankful for your love.
Hallelujah. Lord, I need you to restore me, God. I need you to renew me, refresh me. Jesus, precious name. Come on, why don't you give the Lord just a praise for just a moment. Come on, thank him for his love and mercy and his grace and how he touches, how he restores, how he restrengthens, how he renews and refreshes in our spirit. Lord, we love you, Jesus. precious name. God bless you. You can be seated. I'm just going to make a couple of announcements here. First and foremost, we want to say welcome to all of our guests that we have here tonight. It's especially an honor to have Taylor Stacy visiting with us here tonight. We thank her so much uh, for being here with us tonight. Uh, Tuesday, we have our End Time Prophecy Series. Let me just make sure that I uh, remind you of that. And then, of course, Wednesday night, everything on campus is, is canceled uh, due to Thanksgiving, we want you to have a good time of uh, fellowship with your families. And I know many will be traveling. And so uh, nothing here on Wednesday night, but Tuesday night we will continue uh, our end time prophecy series. Also, uh, the ladies uh, Christmas fellowship uh, is coming up in December on December the 2nd uh, at 6 o'clock. There's information at the greeters desk, a place for you to sign up. I uh, want you to come and be a part of that with the ladies. They always have a good time. Uh, at that Christmas uh, fellowship. It's also a special honor tonight to have uh, brother and sister Beak with us, missionaries to the United Kingdom and the Channel Islands. We are so honored to have them here with us tonight. Amen. We love our missionaries around here, and we are so honored to have them with us here tonight. It's especially uh, an honor. You know, mom and dad are good, but to have Kayla and Alexa they just make it all that much better to have them here as well. And so we are so thankful to have them here with us tonight. So we're going to give them a few minutes here in the service just to present their burden where God's sending them, the field that they're on. So for just a minute here, if you'll watch a video and then they'll be up. I'm James Beek. My family and I are pointed to the UK and the Channel Islands. UK is a, a beautiful place full of beautiful landscapes, large cities, with a population of over 68 million people, a very, very diverse culture. There is three main religions, however, there is 50% of that population that does not identify with any religion at all. My wife and I are so passionate about reaching these precious people. And over the last 10 years, we have been working in this country, seeing the hand of God move in many ways. For the last three years, we have been working in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, we've been the lead pastor there, where we have seen God do mighty and miraculous things in the transformation of people's lives. We've seen young ministers uh, develop from just being saints in the church to becoming young men who would go and preach this precious gospel to whomsoever will. We've seen many people filled and baptized with the Spirit of God and knowing that their life has changed for the good. We have seen many people that would not just hear the Word of God, be a hearer of the Word of God, but become doers of the Word of God and take this precious gospel and go into the streets of any city willing to pray and do whatever the Lord was leading them to do. Mary Catherine and I are very eager to get back to the place of our calling. And we just want to thank each and every one of you for partnering with us in prayer and in giving. Thank you and God bless. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you for letting us be here tonight with you. Give honor to your pastor and his wife, Brother and Sister Cornelius, and we thank you for this precious privilege tonight. Um, I want to take no time in introducing my family to you. Uh, my wife here in the middle is Mary Catherine, my lovely, lovely wife. And then I have my oldest daughter here, Kayla. Why don't you wave your hand, Kayla? Amen. And then my, what's your, young, what's your name? This is Alexa. It's my youngest daughter. And they're, they're both uh, wonderful blessings in our life. Why don't you wave your hand to everybody? No? Okay. She might do it later. You can bribe her or something. But thank you for this opportunity to share our burden for what God is doing in the UK. And I'm just going to quickly hand this over to my wife so she can share some of the treats and the joys of the things that we experience every day in the UK. Praise the Lord, everyone. 
It truly is an honor to be here this evening. Thank you, Pastor and Sister Cornelius, for having us today, or this evening, sorry. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit with you about the UK and Channel Islands. But first, I want to say thank you as well, not only for your missions given, giving. On behalf of all missionaries, we want to say thank you for your monthly pledges that you give for your faith promise, but also any time that you have given towards She's for Christ or Mother's Memorial, these are different avenues that help missionaries out, and we want to say a huge big thank you to all of you. I know this church gives towards that. In the back, we do have a booth, and uh, on the video it says you can partner with us in prayer. We have prayer cards, our pictures on it, so you can remember who we are. It's not just a bunch of writing, uh, but <laughs> you can pray with us. Put it on your fridge, in your wallet, wherever you see it. It will not only help us on deputation, but when we get back to the UK as well, your prayers are coveted very greatly. Now, as you can tell, I do have a slight accent. Um, <laughs> I was born in Scotland. My parents were missionaries, and uh, the Lord called it upon not only my life, but my husband's life that we would follow in their footsteps, and we truly are honored for that. If you go to the UK, if you look at it, first of all, on a map, it's very small. It's about this big. But yes, it does have 68 million people on it. And when people say the UK, they just think England. But uh, we love England. It's a great country. It is the biggest one. But there's also Scotland, where we are based. There's Wales and Northern Ireland. So it consists of four countries. And throughout each of those four countries, there's many different cultures, many different accents, and different ways of life. If you were to turn on your BBC News, you might hear something like this. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. But in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So it's a little bit different, a little bit posher. Not all English accents are like that. They are very broad in range. In Glasgow, Scotland, where we are based, uh, is a slightly stronger accent. And I'm going to read a paraphrase section of the New Testament for you. It's when Jesus calls his disciples to be fishers of men. It is English, but we use slightly different words and turns on words. We'll say it like that. When Jesus heard that John had been put in jail, he went after Galilee. And from then on, he started his preaching, saying, Turn for your sins and turn to God. Now one day, as Jesus was taking a wee dawn along the beach, he saw two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andy, casting their nets in the water. Come on with me, Jesus said to them, and I'll teach you not to catch fish, but to catch men. Well, right there and then, they left their nets and went with Jesus. A wee bit further along the beach, she just saw two mere brothers, Jimmy and John, mending their nets with their feather. Well, Jesus called to them as well, and at once, the brothers left their feather and went with Jesus. So, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So it can get interesting if you come for a visit. Like I said, it is English, um, but with a slightly different twist. What doesn't help matters as well is we use different words for things. So our chips are called crisps. Our fries are called chips. Soccer is football. The elevator is a lift. The trunk of your car is the boot of your car. And the hood of your car is the bonnet of your car. The restroom is just simply the toilet. We don't take the trash out, we take the rubbish out and put it in the bin. If you ask for uh, biscuits and gravy, it won't kind of taste the same. We call cookies biscuits. So, yeah, that can be a bit, little bit confusing for you. <laughs> don't ask for biscuits and gravy when you come. They, you might get a strange look. Another little thing that uh, we've been saying to people that we like to say back home as well is if you want to call someone on the telephone, just tell them, I'll give you a tinkle. <laughs> so that just means you're going to call them later, you know, just give them a tinkle. <laughs> and one last thing that can be very interesting is that uh, we drive on the other side of the road. So uh, it can be interesting. Uh, the steering wheel is also on the other side. It's not the wrong side. It's just the other side. Um, <laughs> but yes, that can be interesting when you're crossing countries between here and the States. It can be interesting having to switch your mind and gear. But I'm going to pass back to my husband. Um, I can stay up here for a while, but I'm going to pass back to my husband, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more of the blessings that God is doing in the UK. Amen, amen. Just quickly, I'll take two minutes and do this, but for the last 10 years, our family has been working in the UK. 
Uh, for the first nine and a half years, we were doing a self-supporting aim, aimers, and we live by faith, and truly God has been so gracious to us and blessed us in many ways, and uh, he's poured out upon our lives uh, extensively, and so we cannot complain. But over those 10 years, we've seen God transition and uh, form the work into something great in the United Kingdom. We've seen the hand of God change our country from where we had 35 churches 10 years ago. We now have 55 churches. In this one last year, we did a record. Uh, we had a record of 253 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. As the national youth leaders, my wife and I work on the team there as the, as the national youth leaders. And in our last uh, national youth camp, we had 28 young people. But last year, we felt God wanted to do more. And so we put on our first ever national youth congress last September. And we prayed for 100. God gave us 300 young people that showed up. And six were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing in Glasgow. God is has been so good to us, and we have a tremendous burden. We have one church in the city of 2.1 million people, and that church has been there for just over 30 years. And so we've been praying, God, build our church so that we can spread out and build many other churches. And in the last three years, you could have come to our church on a Sunday morning, and there would have been 65 people on a Sunday morning. But on the last service, when we left this year, in June, on June the 6th, there was 163 in our morning services. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. On a normal year, on a normal year, we would have 10 to 15 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and we rejoice for that. But in the first six months of this year, we had 24 filled and 18 received a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so we've seen God do great things in transition in our churches and in the work there. God has given us that increase so that we can build many more churches because we have five churches in the country of Scotland with five million people. And it simply is just not enough. And so we need God to do more. And he's beginning to do those things. While we've been on the road, and this is the last part of the testimony, while we've been on the road, we've said, God, we're going to continue the work even though we're on deputation. And so we've been working with our leadership back there. And while we've been on the road, the two churches that we wanted to start, we started two works while we've been on deputation. And so we thank God for these opportunities. That even though while we're on deputation, we're far away from our home, we're saying, God, we know, we believe in that promise. We may be here, but you're still working over there. As you're working here, God is doing the work. And so every month we preach to our church over Skype. We have the setup. And last Sunday, we saw two people get the Holy Ghost and baptized while we were preaching over Skype to our church on a Sunday morning at 630 in the morning. Praise God. And the most precious testimony that we can say about being on deputation was that not this Sunday, but last Sunday, our daughter Kayla was baptized in Jesus name. Praise God for what he's doing in our lives. God bless you in Jesus name. Our daughters just want to say something to tear your pastor's heart out there. Please help us reach the United Kingdom and Channel Alliance. Amen. <laughs> Man, how do you turn that down? Okay, okay, we'll do it, we'll do it, I promise. Awesome, awesome testimony. Isn't technology wonderful? That they can still be... Having church and folks getting the Holy Ghost and churches starting even while they're on deputation. That is such an awesome, awesome thing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And yes, sis, I could have listened to you talk for a little while longer. That would have been fine. And uh, enjoy that, uh, that time. And those little girls, they just you know want to try to rip your heart out. And so <clears throat> I understand that's how you use them. And that's just if you're okay with that. <clears throat> You're okay with it, then we're okay with it. Our ushers are coming. We're going to wait on you for the Lord's tithe and your offering. In the back, they have a table set up and have many different items on that table. If you want to go back after service and uh, greet them, first of all, and help support them with the things they have. They have projects as well, and you can uh, help support them in their projects. We'll support them as a church uh, and PIMs and partners. And so uh, we love our missionaries, and we continue to give to missions because as, I've, as I have said on many occasions, if you want Jesus to come back, you really want the rapture to take place, 
you are strongly, strongly interested in support missions. Because I believe pretty much everything that needs to happen has happened. Save everybody get to hear. And so if you really want the rapture to take place, you're interested in missions. And so we want to send our prayers, but we also want to send finance. And so we, we're excited. We're just inundated tonight with missionaries. Brother Burgess is from a missions family. And uh, it doesn't have as cool a story, but he's from a missions family. <laughs> and then to have the Beaks here with us. Uh, who are also missionaries, and so we are just being blessed tonight by missions. So if you'll stand, we're going to go before the Lord in prayer. We'll pray for the Beak family and what is happening in the UK and ask God to continue to bless that and anoint it. I can't imagine what it is like to have to be away from your church for the period of time that they have to be away. And so thankful that they can still communicate back and forth and that God is still moving and blessing in their absence. A few prayer requests tonight. Remember Sister Lois Hilderman, uh, Sister Beck Ritchie. Also remember her. She had to go to the hospital this morning, uh, but she is doing much, much better. And so continue to pray for her. Uh, Sue Bashir and family also, and Dean Estes and family uh, as well. We want to continue to pray for them uh, and ask God to touch. If you have a need here tonight, why don't you just lift your hand across this room and ask God to touch that need. He knows what it is. Why don't you just share it with him? If you need prayer tonight, you can come down. Ministry will pray with you. But let's go before the Lord in prayer. Ask him to touch here tonight before we move back into worship. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for your power and for your anointing. God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. God, first and foremost, God, we pray, God, for our missionaries. God, we pray for the Beak family. God, for United Kingdom, the Channel Islands. God, we pray for them, Lord, that you would continue to open up doors for them. God, I pray. Lord, that you would open up avenues, Lord, that they can reach those who are there. God, give them favor, Lord, with governments in their area. God, that they would be supported, God, I pray. Lord, I pray that you make it a speedy return, God, and continue to open churches and baptize and fill with the gift of the Holy Ghost, God, even in their absence. Lord, every missionary, we pray right now, God, that you would continue to bless and touch, God, whether they're home missions or foreign missions, God, I pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon them, God, and you would touch their families and God, I pray that you pour out your anointing upon them. God, the names that have been mentioned here tonight. God, you know the needs and you know the situations. God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch it. Every hand that was lifted, God, you know that need. God, we pray, Lord, that you'll touch it. God, bless us here tonight. Bless this offering. Let it go to your kingdom. And we give you all of the praise and adoration in the mighty, powerful, and wonderful name of Jesus. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord.
everything I am, I give to you, Lord. God, I love you, Jesus. Come and have your way tonight, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Great God, no heaven like 
locked up, let it open. No kingdom stands still, let it move. Our faith, our trust, our hope, and our great God, our great God. No heaven locked up, let it open. No kingdom stands still, let it move. Our faith, our trust, our hope, and our great God, our great God. No heaven locked up, let it open. No kingdom stands still, let it move. Our faith, our trust, our hope, and our great God, our great God. No heaven locked up, let it open. No kingdom stands still, let it move. Our faith, our trust, our hope, and our great God, our great God. No heaven locked up, let it open. No kingdom stretch still, let it move. Our faith, our trust, our hope, and our great God, our great God. Let your king, no, let your king, 
some of you a question. Is there anybody in this house that you need a revelation about who God is and who he is particularly to you? Is there something happening spiritual here? See, the first angelic doxology ever sang consisted of one word. That word was holy, 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 holy. But when you start to worship God, something happens. You get a greater, greater revelation of God, right? And so when the, and, and that greater revelation, Brother Beak, makes you want to worship more. So when you read the second angelic doxology, it said, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But see, when you get a greater revelation of God, you want to worship Him more, right? So the third angelic song said, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And then they kept worshiping. And by the time you get to the final song over in Revelation, it goes something like this. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Worthy art thou, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure were they created. And they sing a new song, saying, You're worthy to take the book and open the seals. For thou wast slain and hath redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred. And it goes on and on and on. Your revelation of God you're looking for is not going to be found in an endless quest through your doubt. It's going to be when you worship God from your heart. There's a revelation of His mercy and His power and His deliverance and who He is and what He can do. Well, there's two schools of thought. I've been in Pentecost all my life. One says in a service like this, we just huck and buck and worship. I tend to think the Lord has prepared the moment for the preaching of the Word of God. Is that okay? Thank you. God bless you. I cannot tell you what being here this weekend has done for me. I don't know if it's done anything for you, but boy, it's done a lot for me. You guys are fantastic, and I've fallen in love with you. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I told the leadership team, 
I told the leadership team, I said, I'm, I'm not a preacher. Um, I, I'm a businessman. I'm a consultant. I'm a trainer. Uh, and somebody came by this morning and they said, hey, you know, you said you're not a preacher. I said, yeah. They said, amen to that. <laughs> Got to be honest, it stung a little, but I'll, I'll get over it. Missionaries, oh my Lord, you guys just crushed my heart tonight, took me way, way back. This was my childhood, being on deputation. Uh, you don't know how hard what these people are doing is. And the hardest thing is not traveling and being in church every night. The hardest thing is being away from where God has called you to be. And uh, please pray for them. I don't know how I'm supposed to compete with those two girls. It's like a cuteness overload. I'd, I'd like to have a, a basket of puppies or something up here to keep up with that. Can you guys handle a little preaching tonight or are you all done? <clears throat> so I told the pastor this afternoon, I said Friday, Saturday, this morning, I just like ground on people and beat on them and was mean and ugly. I'm going to be nice tonight. He said, I can't. He, he doesn't think I have it in me. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. I want to preach for just a few moments. I'm completely out of gas. I want to preach for just a few moments on this subject. The seemingly impossible, somewhat suspect, very suspicious, wildly improbable tale of truth. I'm exhausted just hearing the title. God bless you. You can be seated. Interesting question there in verse 3. Let me see if I can paraphrase a little bit without doing violence to the text. If someone chooses not to believe something... Does their not believing affect the truth of what they choose to not believe? Does something become false simply because someone says it's false? A no, truth is a little stronger than that, yes? Is, real, is reality, here's an interesting question, is reality altered by how many people do or do not believe it? Of course not, right? For thousands of years, every person believed the world was flat. And the whole time it was a globe spinning in space, right? For hundreds of years, the brightest minds alive believed the best cure for disease was to drain someone's blood. That's how they killed George Washington. He had the flu and they drained his blood and he died. For most of, of recorded history, men believed earth was the center of the solar system. You realize the idea that earth is not, that's a relatively new idea in human history. Men believed that the earth was the center of the solar system, if not the entire universe. And the whole time that men believed this, the earth was orbiting around the sun. I grew up in Argentina where they firmly believe that Chevy and Chevrolet are two different car companies. And they'll argue with you. Everybody in America knows that's not true, but they will argue that. Just because someone believes something doesn't mean that their belief is accurate. Just because they say something's not true doesn't mean they're right. In Victorian England, it was firmly believed that smoking was good for the digestion and the circulation and the lungs, but just for men. Yes, they were sexist back then as well. The whole time the populace passionately believed this, it was killing them. See, the whole point is simply this. A thing is not true or false based on how many believe it to be true or false. It is not true or false based on the intellectual or academic credentials of the ones declaring its falsity or its veracity. It stands on its own merits, and whether you or anyone else declares it to be false, it is true if it is true. The problem for humanity is that we're all too often more like sheep instead of God's image bearers, and, and, and when everyone says it's true, we believe, and when the majority says it's not, we don't, and we like to think that this little sheeple behavior was a problem of our ancestors, but it's just as big a problem today. 
No matter how many times history has proven to us that appearance has nothing to do with the value of a person, we still judge on appearance more than we ever have before. And no matter how many inspiring stories there are of people triumphing over their circumstances, now more than ever we blame environment and genetics for human failure. No matter how many times the experts have been wrong, we still fold like a wet noodle anytime someone with an advanced degree waves it in our face or gets on CNN and declares themselves an expert. We all tremble and shake and agree with everything they say. When I was a kid in school, I was taught we were headed for another ice age. And they brought in all the graphs, and all the experts said so. And I'm not making this up. We learned how to make igloos when I was in the fifth grade. Because, like, we're going to have another ice age. We're all going to have to live in igloos, and this is where we're headed. Now we've gone the other way, and all the ice caps are going to melt, and we're all going to have to live on boats. And it, I don't know. But every time the experts come along and declare something, we all just tremble in our shoes and go along with it. Let me help you out. Truth is not subject to opinion polls. Truth does not change based on the quantity of people that ascribe to it. Truth does not change because of the qualification of the person declaring it to be true or not. Truth is truth whether anybody believes it or not, whether you agree with it or not. It is just truth. The, the Apostle Paul said, so what if some people don't believe? Does their unbelief really impact the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So Paul draws a conclusion. Are you guys okay? Can you hang with me a little bit tonight? Paul's conclusion is this. He says, let God be true. You're going to have to put a few things together tonight. He said, let God be true. This is the first one. And every man a liar. Okay? So here's the simple, first simple lesson. God said it. It's true. If man said it, it's a lie. We need to get over being so enamored with everyone's opinion and what else everyone else is saying. And everyone else has been wrong more often than they've been right. So what if Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens wrote a couple of books declaring that there's no God and atheism was on the rise? Who cares? Their truth or their, their unbelief does not negate the truth and the reality of God. Get over it. So what that some secularist said Jesus Christ isn't real and they put him on the TV and gave him his own show. It really doesn't matter. Oh, Hollywood made an anti-Christian movie. Who cares? Get over it. Truth is truth no matter whether you, I, anybody else believes it. Right is right. Sin is sin. Godliness is godliness. Truth is truth no matter who believes it. It's high time people of faith quit being little intellectual and spiritual lemmings just running in one direction because everybody said to. In your reasoning, in what you decide to believe, in establishing what is right and true in your values and your morality and your faith, here's your little guidepost. Let God be true and every man a liar. And if the majority agree with God, awesome. We call that revival. If they don't, awesome. I'm going to anyway. Everyone else bowed on the plains of Shinar. But one Hebrew boy looked at the other two and I see said this. I know the king said we should bow and worship his image. And I know everybody else seems to agree with it. But God said, have no other gods before me. Let God be true and him only shall thou worship. Let God be true and this king a liar. Joshua looked the entire nation in the eye and said, you can wind up serving these false gods if you want to. Every last one of you may bow the knee to Baal. I don't care. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let God be true. Every man a liar. What is true is not subject or influenced by popular opinion. It doesn't matter what your friends think you should do. What did God tell you to do? Who cares what is morally acceptable in our culture? What does God find morally acceptable? You don't need a rating system to tell you what is appropriate for your kids to watch. God said, set no evil thing before their eyes. What do you do when your world run headfirst into God's law? Let God be true and every man a liar. Okay, now we're going to have another part to this. So the first thing we've established, God said it, it is. The 
just got shocked. There's a little more cooperation. If God said it, it is? If man said it is a? You guys are awesome. Okay, so now we're going to know a part. Isaiah 53, 1, the prophet set it up like this. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The report Isaiah offered was the promise and prophecy of God. The perpetual decision we all have to make as we move through our life is whose report to believe. Because on the one side, you got God saying, hey, here's truth. On the other side, you got man going, hey, here's your lie. And you got to decide which of them you're going to believe. But there's a lot weighing in that decision, right? You would think it would be easy to believe God over man, right? Right? In spite of the fact that man is wrong more than he's right and God is never wrong, we routinely believe men over God. Why do we do that? Can I go a little extra biblical on you? Samuel Clemens, whom some of you know as, thank you. Was that the high school teacher that said it? Yes, that's what I thought. Everybody else was like, Samuel Clemens, didn't he pitch for the A's back in the 70s? Mark Twain said this. I'm going to tell you why we believe men over God. Because what when God says something, it is what? Let's try it again. When God says something, it is? When man says something, it is a? Mark Twain tells you why we believe lies over truth all the time. Because he said truth is stranger than fiction. Let let me help you out with that. Let, Let me help you out, okay? The lie that man tells you is easy to believe. It makes sense. God's truth never makes sense. It's, it's always a little out there. When God says something, it's, it's kind of wildly improbable, and it's a little suspect, and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But when a man tells you something, it just makes sense. I'm going to get into why here in a second, but, but just hang with me. You, and you, yeah, you've got to go through life perpetually making the choice about whose report you're going to believe. This wildly, unlikely, highly suspicious thing that God is telling you or this thing that man's telling you that just really, really seems to make a lot of sense. The reason man's lies make sense and God's truth seems so strange is man deals in the realm of what I know and understand, but God comes from a dimension that I cannot even and get my head around. The Bible says this, the things which are impossible with man are the very things that are possible with God. In other words, you're not even in God's territory until it's impossible. You haven't even stepped over into God's realm until it is incredible. You're not even moving into God's dimension until it doesn't even make any sense to you. So when the doctor says you're going to die and God says by my stripes you're healed, that lie seems so believable and the truth so improbable and you're going to have to decide whose report are you going to believe the lie or the truth see see you're not even God's territory until it doesn't make sense to you until it's unimaginable and incomprehensible that's why the Bible says stuff like this Now unto him that is able to do beyond what you can ask or think. He can do exceedingly abundantly above what you even know how to ask for. The Bible says that. He said you're going to have to pray in the Spirit because there's some stuff you don't even know how to say it. It's in a God dimension that just doesn't make sense. So yeah, it makes sense that God's truth is not going to make sense. It exists beyond the realm of what's possible for me. It's outside of my comprehension. Anything that man's going to say is going to be in the realm of my experience. But, But we all believed the world was flat while it was globe existed outside of our experience. Whose report are you going to believe and what will you believe? The lie of man or the seemingly impossible, somewhat suspect, very suspicious, wildly improbable truth of God or the so believable report of man? Can I go back to Isaiah for a second? He says... Whose report are you going to believe? But there's something at stake. Because he follows it up. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? 
This is a continuation here. What he's saying is, depending on whether or not you believe his report, will determine whether or not you see the arm of the Lord. Hang with me. Hang with me. I, I really, I'm like almost done. He said, if you believe the report, if you believe the wildly t improbable tale of God, you're going to see the strength of God. You're going to see the arm of the Lord. Who hath believed a report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? If you believe the report of God, you're going to see the strength and saving and delivering power of God. If you believe God, the arm of the Lord is going to be revealed to you. Now, before we get too deep in that, what if you choose not to? Now, there's implications both ways. Okay? Can we, can we go through what we've learned so far? Real quick, real quick refresher. If God says it, it is. If man says it, it is a. It makes sense to believe the man because it's in the realm of our experience. God's is not. If we believe the report of God, we see the strength of God in our life. But what if we don't? Well, the Bible answers that in 2 Thessalonians 2.11. God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That word damned there means without hope. So let me break it down for you. I'm going to have to go through my life choosing to believe the wildly suspicious, highly unlikely tale of truth that comes from God. And brother, every time I believe it, I see the strength of God in my life. Or I'm going to have to believe the lie that makes so much sense to me. And every time I'm going to be left hopeless and without an answer. So I got a question for you tonight. Who are you going to believe? All the logic that seems to make sense and seems right and seems sincere. Or are you going to believe this wild tale that God's telling you and see the power of God loose in your life? Man said it lie. God said it truth. Believe God. See his strength and delivering power. Believe the lie and be left without hope. And it's going to make sense. And God never makes sense. But what he's telling you will deliver you. Almost done. Seriously, I'm, I, I'm almost done. You, you got man said it. You can't believe it. <laughs> Nicely done. I, I, so I, I, I told you it's gonna be nice tonight. I'm gonna simplify life for you. I'm gonna give you a gift. I'm gonna make your life simple. You're going to have many opportunities to believe many reports in your life. You will either believe the comfortable lie and be left with no hope. Or you're going to believe the seemingly impossible, somewhat suspect, very suspicious, wildly improbable truth of God. And see the power of God erupt in your life. Those are your choices. And you're not the first one to have to make them. The story of your Bible is a person after person having to go, am I going to believe the lie that makes sense or am I going to have to believe this highly suspicious, wildly improbable tale of truth? And you see it over and over and over in Scripture. Abraham said his loins were dead. But God said, no, they're not. Sarah said, I'm too old to have a baby. God said, no, you're not. Jacob said that you can't have the birthright because you're the second born. But he had it anyway. Jacob said, my son is dead. I see the bloody robe in my hand. God said, no, he's not. I'm elevating him to the throne of Egypt. Joseph was supposed to spend his life in prison, but he didn't. Moses was supposed to die as an infant, but he didn't. The Israelite, are you hearing me tonight? Over and over, the story gets crazy easier and it gets wilder but it's true the Israelites said we don't have any food in this wilderness but bread fell out of heaven they said there's no water in this desert but the rock split in two and a river rushed out of it oceans are not supposed to part but they did you're not supposed to walk through a sea on dry land but they did fish you're not supposed to swallow men and spit them out but they did I'm telling you it's crazy it's wild it's improbable but it's truth I know it doesn't make sense I know it
They told Joshua the walls won't fall, but they did. Sanballat told Nehemiah, you can't build that here, but God said that you can. Saul told David, you can't fight that giant, but he said, I can in the name of the Lord. I I know it doesn't make sense, does it? Oh, I'm not done. Don't sit down. I'm so close to the end, you might as well stay there. You see, over and over and over, the tale of truth just doesn't make any sense. It's just not right. You're not supposed to have revival in the UK where it's burned up and dead, but you are. You heard it tonight. You're not supposed to recover from some kinds of cancer, but you have. There are some things in life you're not supposed to get free from, but I got some witnesses in the house that you can be delivered, you can be restored, you can be made whole. Who are you going to believe tonight? The three, <laughs> the king told the three Hebrew boys, you got to bow. They said, no, we don't. They said, you're going to burn. They said, no, we won't. The king said, you can't pray to Jehovah. But Daniel said, yes, I can. The king said, you're going to be devoured by lions. He said, no, I'm not. The Lord will shut their mouth. It just gets crazier and crazier and crazier. But the power of God is revealed again and again. I wonder if there's anybody in the house tonight that wants to believe the wildly improbable, highly suspicious, very unlikely tale of truth. The widow told Elijah, we're going to starve. There's no food left. But the cakes kept popping out of the oven. They said nothing good can come from Nazareth. But the king of the world did. Kings are not supposed to be born in stables. But he was. You're not supposed to lay masters down in feed troughs. But they did. Herod said, I'm going to kill him. But he didn't even though he was the king. It just goes on and on and on. tale of truth is the craziest thing you'll ever hear. You've heard the joke. Little boy comes home from Sunday school. His skeptic dad says, well, what'd they teach you? How God drowned the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea. His dad said, son, they got scientific studies that show he said, the Israelites didn't escape on dry ground. They got studies that show there was only six inches of water in the sea at that time. He said, my God, Daddy drowned an entire army in six inches of water. <laughs> Whose report are you going to believe? Jeremiah, you're not supposed to touch lepers and walk away clean, but Jesus did. Men can't walk on water, but he did. The thief had no shot at paradise. He went there anyway. That stone was supposed to seal Jesus' grave, but it didn't. Saul the persecutor was never supposed to be a preacher, but he was. Fishermen and tax collectors don't change the world, but they did. They told Peter, don't you preach in that name again, but he did anyway. They told Peter, you're going to die at dawn, but he didn't. They told the apostle, you ain't ever getting out of this jail cell, but at midnight, the chain shook loose off of them. Gentiles are not supposed to receive the Holy Ghost, but they did anyway. Somebody said, you can't get free from that addiction. I bet I got somebody in this house that can testify that ain't true. Satan says you're never going to be used by God. The truth says yes you will. And the truth will set you free from every one of those damnable lies that has limited you and bound you and kept you in. And I come against the lies in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let God be true. Let God be true. Let God be true. And every person that's ever told you anything contrary to the will of God, let them be a liar and reject their lie. Somebody needs to shout at that voice in your head right now. You're a lie from hell. You're a lie from the devil. Let the truth set you free.
I can just keep going and going. I got pages of this stuff. It all came out of that book right there. said the Holy Ghost isn't for us today. Anybody know that that's a lie? Brother right here in the Nike jacket, right here in the Nike jacket, you're talking, Brother Hubert, leave him alone. I'm trying to talk to this man. Lift your hands right now. Lift your hands, both hands, up to heaven, both hands, lift them up. Father, right now, I don't know who these people are, but the truth is going to be explosive in their life and in their heart. Father, I pray the arm of the Lord be revealed. We reject the lies that have been said about us and over our life. We reject the lies that have come to us. And... They said, there's no forgiveness for some of the sins you've committed. But the truth says, I will remove your iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, who are you going to believe? They said, you can't come back from that. God said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Everything is new. Who are you going to believe? You're going to sit there hopeless and damned? Or are you going to see the arm of the Lord revealed in your life? God walked into the garden like he did every evening and said something like, hey kids, and where every time before there had been fellowship, now there was only silence. And he coaxed them out and they had these weird little things made with fig leaves. He's like, nice outfits, guys. Why'd you hide? We were afraid and we were naked. God asked them an interesting question. Who told you you're naked? Where'd, where'd you pick up on that little tidbit? Because see, they weren't naked. The Bible says they were clothed in innocence and in the glory of God. Who told you that about you? And there's some folks sitting in this house. You believe some stuff about you. And I'm here to tell you, if what you believe about you limits you and diminishes you, you didn't get that from God. It's a lie. And as long as you believe it, you're going to be hopeless. The moment you say, I reject that lie, God, show me the truth about who I'm supposed to be in you. You're going to see the arm of the Lord reveal. My brother in the orange shirt right here, would you lift your hands? Would you lift your hands? Lift them both right now. Brother behind him, lay hands on him. Father, you know the lie that's been told to him about who he is and what he can be. That did not come from you. That did not come from you. That did not come from you. And we reject it right now. Everyone else in this house, hands stretched toward heaven. Father, right now, some of us have lived with some stuff. I got a question for you, sweet people of God. Who told you you're naked? Who told you you're not worthy? Who told you you cannot? Who told you there's no forgiveness for you? Who told you you can't have the dream that God put in your heart? Who It wasn't God that told you that. Who are you going to believe? If you want to believe the report of God and see the arm of the Lord reveal, get to this altar. Come down here with your hands lifted and say, God, I'm tired of believing the lie. I want to reject it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to embrace the truth of you and who you are and who you can be in me. Come on. Who told you you're not good enough? Who told you you're not smart enough? Who told you you're not young enough? Who told you you're too old? Right 
Come on, whose report are you going to believe? Whose report are you going to believe? you got to believe. I know it's crazy. God's going to tell you some stuff in this altar about you. He's going to tell you some stuff about your future. He's going to tell you some stuff about your life. And it's going to sound crazy. It's going to sound wild. But it's the tale of truth. Who told you your family can't be saved? Who told you your marriage can't be healed? Who told you it's not going to happen for you? That's a lie. That's a lie. Someone needs to tell the devil he is a liar and that you're not listening to it anymore. Check some lies. Come on, let God talk to you about you. Believe it, believe it, believe it. I know it's crazy. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> 